Uh, let's uh, let's go for the uh, the talks. So the first talk will be by, by uh, Yuli uh, from uh, uh, Michigan. So he's going to talk about the quantum oscillations in resistivity and magnetization insulators. Right. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Um, I set up my timer. Um, I believe I was asked to initiate the discussion and keep as much time as I can. So I'm going to end in 20 minutes. If I do not have enough time, I don't have to finish my talk. But I would rather ask you guys to come and raise questions during my talk. I appreciate the discussion rather than I'm giving a boring talk. Okay. All right, good. So, well, the selling point, of course, this is about topology correlation, right? I'm not saying I believe it anymore. I'm presenting an interesting compounds, the compound that was discovered way, way older than what I Plan. But um, it's a similar hypothesis to start with, and we try to see what happens there by looking at different kinds of problems and interesting features. I have to say that um, Jenny gave a wonderful introduction and set up the problem really well. It's a compound known for more than 50, 60 years, right? And why we're look, still looking at that. Because of interest, because of observation, because uh, controversies in interpretations, and that's, that makes us excited, right? And in this particular case, um, let me quickly go through, oops, sorry, there we go. Um, yeah, so, so um, we had a wonderful collaborations, particularly Professor Igas Nielsen was wonderful, wonderful postdocs and students, they really studied everything. Now back to the controversy, right? I wouldn't go into the selling points about topology, but just saying that, as you guys seen from Jenny's wonderful talk, there is mystery. The observation of quantum oscillations in this particular compound only in magnetization. And as far as what we say, right? In this particular case, we first look at the magnetic torque versus the magnetic field. I look at how sample deflects the tendon nerve, right? And we see a quadratic dependence on low temperature. And so at low field, low temperature, this is nothing special, right? Torque is M cross H. So it's a product of M and H, which just saying that M is linear, it's paramagnetic, right? But the field is strong enough, we start seeing wiggles or beating pattern wiggles, which means we have multiple orbits, right? And when we look at the orbits, we carry out our spectrum analysis, this is F, the Fourier transform, of course, right? When we see the dominant features, we find the quadrat, um, sorry, we find the wall cost angle dependence that comes for this two dimensional cylinder like firm surface. All right, okay, so that is our observation. And our observation supports, at least from our data, this kind of cylinder like firm surface. Within a year, Suchitra presented this wonderful new paper and presenting another confirmation of oscillation only in magnetization, again, in the same compound with different growth condition for sure. But um, then that started all the discussions and debates. This says, I want to emphasize, it's pretty much same range of this size. In this review article, we actually did a detailed comparison to, to compare our data sets to me as an experimentalist. I would say that they are pretty much the same data sets. Two, two different groups using samples grow by different conditions. And at least in small orbital size, we are having more or less similar data, let me put it that way. Of course, the selling point was there's much, much larger orbits in her samples, which unfortunately we did not chance to recover, to, re, to discover that. And for this dominating feature, their model is in long ellipsoids, right? And to me, again, given the data sets, I would say they're pretty much the same way. Ours is, we say it's 2D, maybe there's a quasi 2D, but anyway. Um, all right. So of course, this come as a surprise, right? Surprise to see that why and how we have insulator to show any oscillation. And again, within a few years, as Jenny presented, the uh, the group led by Professor Rosa from the Los Alamos presented their data showing that polling samples to think thing enough and 
quantum oscillation is gone. They are so nice to actually share their samples with us. They measure only up to 12 Tesla, right? We actually measure their sample up to 45 Tesla, and we confirm that there's no quantum oscillations in their mechanical polished float, uh, flux curve samples. What was surprising to us was instead of the oscillations, we started to observe hysteresis. Again, that's a big puzzle, right? This is, again, this is the data. And by the way, we also confirmed the same feature using samples polished by my, co my colleague, Charlie and Kodak All right, okay. So again, mystery happens. There's a gap. We know can potential sees a gap as what, when we study the resistivity versus temperature, right? But how come there's a longer level condensation? There's one of the and including some from the audience, right? I'm not qualified to comment on any of this, right? But I, I appreciate the effort here to understand what's going on and how to figure out along the level quantizations, even though you seem to have a chem potential within the gap. All right. Now, the very first, as experimentalist, right? I'm taking all these different challenges. The very first challenge is how would we figure out it's a bulk of surface? Many colleagues ask me, why not we just do a simple thickness dependence, making the volume sm smaller, area more the same. Maybe we can actually figure out what's going on. Right, we tried, and apparently now we know that portion thing actually creates hysteresis. We don't quite know how to appreciate that, how to understand that, and of course, each measurement cycle is half a year, so many time, and eventually, and I think we had an argument to say something slightly different as a control experiment from a different angle. In this way, it's particularly like this. We look at different samples. We by chance found this ugly sample. What do we mean by ugly, right? Typical sample, this is a cubic structure sample and you should be able to observe a simple um, rectangular shape, right? Whereas in this guy, it was, came out of flux grow as something different shape and we can actually confirm oscillations as we did very low temperature, at strong fields and we rotate the angle within this plane, which means from 0, 0, 001 to 100, 0, 0, which means we should have a full force symmetry determined by a structure, which indeed it is, right? We have all kinds of orbital sides determined by the oscillation frequencies. And we look at the oscillation frequency and the dominating feature, we track detailed angular dependence. Those coming from this direction, whether it's direction of the bulk this way or the other way, red or blue, or from surface this way or, red or the other way, they give me the same full fold symmetry. And it's not surprising, right? You have a cubic structure, whether it's coming from surface states or coming from bulk. The crystal structure should determine the electronic structure, which means the orbital size should be the same. 90 degrees away from each other. What surprised us was the following. When we look at the amplitude, again, what do we did? We look at each peak, right? We look at this peak and in their spectrum in the same condition. We find out that in one particular direction, their oscillation amplitude is way bigger than oscillation amplitude along the other direction. Right. So we're puzzled, right? Apparently the oscillation amplitude itself breaks the rotational symmetry. Why and how, we do not know. But we do know for most quantum oscillation data or any amplitudes, what the, what the dominating factor for oscillation amplitude is mobility. So this difference tells me that for this particular compound, whatever origin we have, the mobility along this direction is better than mobility along the other direction. So anyway, so that's my control experiments. For me, if it's 100% bulk or 100% from certain islands of impurity of the of aluminum, I just want to say, oh, yes. So your oscillations along some other direction, you get an intermediate amplitude, or you don't even want to compare them because they are the right. So so the oscillation gets in every direction, right? So this is actually how we can track which from which, right? This branch is this branch. This branch is the other one. So basically what we are doing is we find that their 
let's say dominating 10 different frequencies, depends on angle, depends on projection from one surface to the other surface or from one orbit to the other particular direction. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You see this difference in mobility on the, okay. Right, oh, oh, oh. See it in oh right, right. This is an excellent point. Yes, we do. But the, 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 the once the feature is not as dominating as that in the Fourier transform, I'm not putting much weight on that. But that's an excellent point. Yeah, by the way, I forgot to mention that this coming from 101 facets. For whatever reason, 101 direction, 101 facets depends on how we interpret that. But overall, we seem to see that the mobility changes right, in different orientations. Oh, anyway, so, so simple experimental fact and tell me that maybe it's not 100% block, maybe surface doing something. However, I'm still reluctant to say it's 100% surface because of the fact that we have no relation observed at all from the resistivity. Not only my group, Suchitra's group, as well as the Los Arms group, many others tried up to 45 Tesla, 65 Tesla, or I or even have 80 Tesla data from my colleague, Charlie and Kodak. We couldn't resolve any oscillations, and that's a big mystery, right? If it's 100% surface state, how, what, and if this happened on the surface, what prevents them, prevents us to put a probe on that? And I think that, okay, that's a big mystery. And that actually, I believe, started all this interesting discussion about whether this is a exotic quantum oscillation that can be only detected in magnetization. I don't think so. At least I'm not ready to say there's no oscillation at all in electrical transport or in any other transport, right? Maybe, again, as an experimentalist in low energy science, basic science research, right? We're not trained to give us five sigma error bar to say there's nothing going to ever, ever happen, right? Rather, I still need to get a better, better sample, better technique, and better fields. But at least we can try something. And to answer this important question, if the oscillation will never couple into the E fields, right? And maybe it's natural to say this is a charge, right? And otherwise, maybe we have to think hard about what, sorry, how, how a charge neutral thing couple into B fields, but not to the E fields, right? And for me, the solution, at least to the first order, would be that let's look for some other potential kind of insulator candidates with the potential band inversion, right? And try to find out those with similar gap or smaller gap, those with smaller gap closing fields, right? So that our D5 Tesla or 6 to 5 Tesla was enough. We've tried many compounds. We filled mirably after five or six different directions. Eventually, we find out a good candidate is this. I don't even know how to pronounce the name. You know. But, but. <laughs> But, 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 but you see the contrast between SMB6 and WebB12, right? My colleague Charlie put up to D5 Tesla, nothing happened. And then there's not even signature gap closing. Whereas this guy, early data, up to 40, by the way, this is in kilo R state, so there's a factor of 10 there. But up to 40 Tesla or 50 Tesla, gap should be gone, right? So that eventually we find that someone was able to got samples for us for that particular, this is Professor Matsuda from Kyoto um, and, and from Professor Iga eventually, right? And when we look at resistivity versus temperature, if I'm not showing structure of the sample, just looking at the data, I will see that you see that five or six order magnitude change in resistivity. From that one, I will say that this is very similar. Oh, I, I would guess this is SMB6 resistivity data it is, right? Of course, we know it's not. And, and, and the gap is also small. Now, we also look at the activation behavior up to 45 Tesla within a limited temperature range, of course, right? And even up to 45 Tesla, I'm still seeing about two order magnitude change of resistivity as we cool down from three Kelvin to 20 Kelvin. Yes? This one? Yeah, yeah. So, so this is come from experimental facts in the sense that we cannot take continuous data sets. Um, so, so, okay. Well, let, 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 so, so, 
um, we had to run from 0.3 to higher temperature. All this data we had to take in the dual fridge. So, so, so it's, it's the same sample in different rounds. Yeah. Is it fair to say that by 45 tesla, you can the um, I did not present the data here, but it turns out, no. When we, when we try the activation giver plot, it's, it, it does not work very well, of course, right? And the, the gap, value we infer actually turns out to be slightly bigger based on whatever thing that we, we try there. So, so I guess what I should say that the thermal activation picture is not a perfect picture for us to understand the temperature dependence or resistivity. Maybe a slightly different way. Mm -hmm. Is the insert a metal transition induced by the field? Is it roughly in second order or closer? Good point. Again, I don't quite know. This, so, 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 so I don't quite know based on the data we have right now, how to understand the order of that transition, but that's a very good question. This actually made me wonder, eventually we should study a thermal electric measurements along that direction. Yeah. So what's the number of people here? Oh, oh yeah. I'm, I'm... Oh, you caught me. I should know. Sorry, I, I couldn't remember. Then again, I'm new. I'm 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 new in this field, right? But yes, I'm really new for the hyper fermion field, right? You guys know way better than I do. You didn't hear the question. Actually. I didn't hear. The question. Oh yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, the question is the following. The question is uh, how to understand the crystal field that's splitting for the e turbine, Thanks. right? Um, um, I wish I can give you the answer right away, but. I'm sorry, I'm not, I'm not expert on that one. Any questions? All right, so you see the data already, magnetic torque versus magnetic fields. I think that partially answers your question. At least we know, oh, I'm sorry, I do not even have a low field data, but a low field is, is a quadratic dependent on torque, which means we have a paramagnetic state, right? There are signature of certain king happening around 20 Tesla, Maybe above that, maybe something, something happened, right? But at least around this range, again, and let me emphasize, when the electro transport is still showing a semiconductor-like behavior, we are seeing oscillation in magnetic hole, which is just like what we saw in SMB6, all right? This is, of course, this is the new data, right? This is a new feature. Electro resistivity versus magnetic field finally give me wiggles. And furthermore, we can look at the temperature dependence. And from the temperature dependence, what we, what we can infer, we can try to figure out all these wiggles as a function of temperature, if they're aligned, if well, they're not. If they're not aligned, typically we would expect it's a feature due to a field, magnetic field driven transition. Whereas in this case, more or less, they're in the same fields. And this gives us confidence that we are seeing a quantum oscillation due to a longer level quantization. Okay, now here is the most important results for us, right? We are seeing oscillations in magnetization to has melt in fact. We're also seeing oscillations in resistivity SDH in fact. We try different angles looking at the different geometry and, and for any angles we are looking at, we find out that the oscillation amplitude versus temperature follows the LK formula. And let me emphasize, LK formula is nothing special. It's simply your Fermi Dirac distribution taking a derivative. In other words, right, having this temperature dependence tell me that we must have a fermion. Many discussions about how boson would give this behavior, and at least in this particular compound, as well as in SMB6 from my data, I don't see any signature boson. Now, the puzzle, of course, coming when we look at the angular dependence. When we only look at angular dependence of the oscillation frequency, we have three wiggles. Again, let me emphasize the data. Three wiggles gave, gave me a large error bar, which means I can interpret this as a sphere or cylinder, right? 
So whether it's 3D or 2D, it's debatable. However, when we look at SDH, this angular dependence trend turns out to be much faster than the cylinder, which means we have to have an orbit like this, like dark spawn, right? It's like, like a small orbit touching two big hidden firm surfaces. For us, we're not able to resolve that big hidden firm surface. Who knows how big the orbital size is gonna be? But, 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 but bottom lines, based on this data, I have to consider this as a three-dimensional feature. Just no other way around. All right. Finally, of course, within a year, our collaborator, Matsuda's group, Yuji Matsuda, look at the thermal transport and they believe the carb XS thermal conductivity as plotted here shows a non-zero interception that goes to T0. So in that sense, they believe there's a mobile carrier, even though sample is a, there's a mobile fermion-like carrier, even though sample and that temperature is still in the gap. And this came nice surprise for us since the central keeps saying that that must be true. But unfortunately, the suggestion from his paper would be at this regime, we should look at a large thermal angle. It didn't have up to 12 Tesla, but we're not giving up yet. Okay. All right. Finally, um, let me take two more minutes. There are always questions saying that why? why, how we know this does not come from the residual of metal, because we know 45 to 50 Tesla sample would turn into metal. Maybe we should just have some residual metal sitting as islands that give me all these features. So we have to test what happens in much stronger fields, right? And indeed, this is what we're doing here. We push up to 65 or 75 Tesla, and we sample turns out to be great metal. Simple electro transport is challenging in positive environments. So we, we did the AC conductivity measurements working with um, Dr. Um, Singleton and Los Armas. And when we look at this, which Delta F, by the way, is effective measurements of ball conductivity, and we start to see these wiggles. And if Emily is here, this is actually the splitting based on the wiggles. But anyway, in this way, we actually see the nice pattern. We're able to track, uh, we're able to look, construct the, the longer level um, diagram there the indexing plots. And the index plots, again, gave us big surprise. Again, let me see that this is versus inverse H, right? Right hand, it's a insulator from transport. We look at what happens in oscillation in resistivity, have that index show me a linear line, which is what we expected out of a simple metal. Insulator, simple metal, right? Metal, when we look at instant plots, I'm showing a strong nonlinear line. We have to confirm that's nonlinear. So that's why we push up to 73 Tesla to make sure the trend follows. But so it's a nonlinear line, even though sample is a metal. That's a big puzzle to us. Again, insulator shows something like metal, metal shows something completely strange. To linearize this, you see we have many different angles. What we find out the only way, I'm sure it's the only way, the best way to find out is this way is to assume that there is offsetting fields, whether it's a gauge fields or something different. In a range of about 41 Tesla, when we look at a change in field versus one over H, we start to have this nice linear line. All right, what does that mean? We don't quite know. But we have to figure out what happens in magnetization because this is a still SDH. I want to learn more about interhesimal open. That's why we are pushing for resolutions in magnetometry in high frequency measurements to see if we were able to resolve that. And of course, we are not giving up for the thermal Hall effects and others. Let me stop here. And this is how, that's my conclusion. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Any, any question? Yeah, so, uh, yeah. Um, I know you've measured the heat capacity at low fields. Um, so this, if you try to push that up to, I uh, said you're planning to measure the thermal conductivity, but, uh, heat capacity is presumably an easier measurement, right? No, then, thermal con heat capacity is not a measurement. It's same China experiments. So first of all, I did not do that, right? Yeah. 
but 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 the idea would be can we look at oscillations in heat capacity in the range that we yeah. may be interested in, right typical study was up to 14 or 18 tesla which is way not enough as what we speculated it's the same fridge that they find are able to available up to 32 tesla maybe that's doable right yes. this is so but that's great suggestion i'm actually talking with greg to see if that's feasible yes you know there's a paper by our drama is showing right that's what that's right that's right yeah Yes. Yeah, so, so if we trust the, 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 the effective mass that Jenny determines in some RM hexaboride, like several right. hundred, right. Um, is it such a surprise that you don't see quantum oscillations in some RM hexaboride in resistivity? Why, why are you so surprised? To me, it's, it's related to the mass. It's too heavy. You can't see it. Right. That's, that's a very good point. And that's a point, right? The mass so great. Maybe that's the origin why we're not seeing the... The oscillation at all in resistivity. What puzzled us was the following, right? We still see oscillations, and by we, we mean our group, Suchitra's group, right? And in some, in, in, yeah, at least both of us observe oscillation in magnetization. Whatever gives that oscillation, whether it's a bulk or surface, we still see a light mass, right? Now, does that mean that for some magical reason that the magnetization pick up a light mass, but the resistivity should follow what happens in her spectrum, right? Maybe that's the origin, but I don't quite know. I don't quite understand how thermodynamic measurements gave something light, but electrons transport does not. Okay. Hi, um, question about the ytterbium compound. Right. So uh, I'm not as familiar with the literature, but I, I, I am familiar with some of the older works on samarium hexaboride uh, that, you know, especially before the advent of topology discussed, especially the, the low temperature uh, resistivity as a, you know, because of some kind of in-gap states, right. trivial in-gap states, let's just say, <laughs> yeah, 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 they're right. you know, Fermi surface or not. Right. What's the status in, in ytterbium? And is it possible that there might be a contribution from those? So, 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 so I guess, should we try to ask Peter, why is it Peter? <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, should we try to run certain kind of terahertz measurements? That's a very great question. Um, if Peter is not interested, his former postdoc was, and at least he, he asked me. <laughs> yeah, but that's wonderful point. That's a great point. Uh, I have a question. Okay. Yes, please. Thank you. Um, I'm not very familiar with this compound very much, but are there the difficult to STM because STM you can get uh, either surface contributions or uh, such stuff close to the formula and you can right. get residual right. uh, density right. states and um, those peaks, so, which can be very, very. Um, yeah. Right. Now, this is excellent point. We do know people tried polish for the photo emission, which they claim, I think very convincing data that instead of topological crystalline insulator as a theory predict, it's a topological insulator start with. But for STM, it might be harder because we know this compound is very hard. It's set, I believe it's second with diamond because when I try to thin down and cut this with a diamond saw, I broke two saw. I spent a whole afternoon in Los Alamos to try to cut the sample down, it, it, well, nature is unkind for that. Yeah. Okay, yeah, maybe, maybe Jenny, last question, yeah. Okay. Should I just tell you? Yeah, I'll talk to So if I understand correctly, still nobody's seen quantum oscillations of any kind in carefully aluminum polished out flux grown samples SMB6, is that true? true? Okay, True. correct. So have, has anybody tried to look for quantum oscillations in flux grown samples in which there's intentionally um, samarium vacancies or substitutions that one would expect to see in flux grown, I'm sorry, in a floating zone, right? So the point is, if, if we see quantum oscillations in floating zone, we know that there's about 0.1% samarium site defects in floating True. zone. Right. So has anybody tried to look at flux grown samples, inch ones intentionally puts the same concentration of defects. Right, like Young Suk Oh um, has 
done these. Yeah. Please, please. Yeah. We actually tried to intentionally uh, put uh, some iron vacancies into the flux quern, uh, some yeah. hexaprovide. Me, we, I mean, uh, Priscilla and colleagues. And we looked at these samples, and in the flux quern samples, it turns out that uh, there is, you know, even for 60% samarium only in the, in the, what you put in, this, the samples grow basically as one to six. Oh, I can show so you the results you later on. Being just at O's um, resistivity plus, you think that even though they're nominally 40% deficient, they're still actually at it, Yes, exactly. I, I okay. can show you the data. It, it, that's amazing, but okay. it, it didn't work out. So we wanted for four, that was one way, you know, to play with the surfaces yeah. and so on. It didn't work out at all. Okay. We were so surprised, uh, but I you're kind of saying that that paper is wrong. Is that right? Sorry. You're kind of saying that that paper is wrong. The the PNAS with the resistivity of submarine deficiency. Oh no no no! I'm not saying this. Oh. Uh, you have to be careful with uh, nominal versus uh, actual paper. Let, let me add to that. Um, again, I believe. Okay, I know nothing about growth, but I did happen to have. Um, Calling students, giving me samples with different level of GD is what? Gadolinium, right? Because this was argument about magnetic screening actually given from survey. And that particular actual double samples were still giving us like, oscillations. Magnitude is getting weaker. Right. And they give you That's correct. Okay, so there, so there is an existence quantum oscillations in flux the only one they're doped. Is that what I'm hearing? When they're doped, we still have oscillations. Doped? Yes. Show right. Yes. Yes. Um, um, again, data one year before pandemic shutdown. So it's not conclusive enough for us to put it out. But yes, we did that test. Thank you. OK. Yeah, that's, that's a thank you again. Thank you, guys. Okay, uh, let me get started.